welcome to today's edition of the Poetry Anthology. Um, I hope you're all uh, very well out there. Um, and today's lesson is going to be on um, The Soldier by Rupert Brooke. So this is a poem about the idea of, of patriotism. And patriotism is the, the love that you might show for your country. Now, often this is very, very harmless. For instance, singing the national anthem when supporting your football team or waving a flag um, on the Queen's birthday. Sometimes, however, uh, patriotism can can lead to um, to very, very harmful outcomes. Indeed, it's been blamed um, for the First and Second World Wars. Because often uh, patriotism comes with the belief that your country uh, is not only something to love and protect, but that your country is perfect and perhaps better than, than other countries. Um, so let's have a look at the background to the poem. You can see Rupert Brooke up in the top right hand corner. So the poem was written in 1914, around about the beginning of the First World War. Um, and Brooke um, was a soldier during World War I um, who didn't die in battle, but unfortunately died of blood poisoning. And he was himself buried in a foreign field in Cyprus. And this is quite ironic because um, it's one of the key quotes in the poem. Um, he almost predicted his own death. However, again, ironically, um, he was never actually involved in active service himself. Um, he died before he ever, ha ever had a chance to do that. Um, and I think that the key idea about the poem is just how patriotic he feels about England. The poem is very much a love letter to his country. So before we actually look at the poem, let's have a think about its form. So um, the type of poem that uh, Brooke chose to use. And it was a sonnet. And the sonnet describes Brooke's patriotic view that it's glorious and honourable um, to die for your country. And specifically, if you happen to die for England, uh, which for Brooke was the most amazing country in the world. And as I said, it, it acts as a love poem to England. He romanticises and praises England for its beauty and um, its bounty, its, its abundance, um, its nature. And uh, Brooke had a very idealistic view of war and what it was like um, or would be like to die in a battle because, of course, he, he never experienced that himself. Um, and by idealistic, I mean um, it's, it's, it's all caught up in these ideas of glory and honour and courage and bravery. And the poem is the complete opposite to Wilfred Owen's Dulce et Decorum Est, who shows the real truths that, that hid behind some of this propaganda in the horrors um, of the battlefield. And of course, Owen experienced war himself um, as, he, as he documents in his poetry. And so it's a sonnet, a 14 line poem um, on the theme of love, the love for England. So let's have a read. The Soldier. If I should die, think only this of me, that there is some corner of a foreign field that is forever England. There shall be in that rich earth a richer dust concealed, a dust whom England bore, shaped, made aware, Gave once her flowers to love, her ways to roam, a body of England's breathing English air, washed by the rivers, blessed by sons of home. And think, this heart, all evil shed away, a pulse in the eternal mind, no less, gives somewhere back the thoughts by England given. Her th sights and sounds, dreams happy as her day, and laughter, Learn to friends and gentleness in hearts at peace under an English heaven. So at home now, it would be sensible just to pause the video and spend a moment reading it again, perhaps twice. Right, 
let's have a look at the poem a little bit more closely. We're going to start by looking at the language that's used and some of the key themes of the poem. And then we'll switch into having a quick look at the structure. So let's start with the title. Always useful to say something about the title of a poem if you can. And for me, it's interesting that um, Brooke chose to use the word the here. And with thinking here about the universal soldier experience, the soldier, it could be any soldier. It's not a particular soldier, it's all soldiers. So he wanted to write a poem that would apply to everybody. Let's look at the first two lines. If I should die, think only this of me. Let's start by looking at the word if. Okay, this seems to me to be an acceptance here, a willingness perhaps to die, um, to make the ultimate sacrifice for his country. Okay, and he's perhaps being humble as well. Think only this of me. Um, some might argue that, that underneath this is a little bit of egocentrism. Maybe, maybe not. And then let's look at the next line. There's some corner of a foreign field. Okay, so he's imagining dying a long way away from home, somewhere in an anonymous foreign field, could be anywhere. But in the next line, look at the enjambment here. It flips, that is forever England. And there seems, first of all, to be a contradiction here, a bit of what we call a paradox. So how can a bit of a foreign field be forever England? Um, and this also suggests something um, to do with English superiority, this idea that um, if he dies in this foreign field, that that corner will kind of belong to England. And of course, what we know about the context of the poem is that in 1914, we were still in the midst of the colonial period where England and Britain owned a huge proportion of the world. So it was an idea that would have um, that would have suited the the original audience of the poem. They'd have been very, um, uh, they would have expected a poet like uh, like Brooke to to have this sort of pride in his country and belief that they could own anywhere. Let's look at the next line then. There shall be in that rich earth a richer dust concealed. So this idea is furthered here. Um, the idea that his dust, so uh, whatever's left of him after his body's decayed in that foreign field, uh, will be richer than the earth that surrounds it. So again, superiority, richer, better um, than the, the, the foreign dust around it. We also have some um, religious imagery here as well. Um, the idea that, that he will be rewarded in death. Um, he will become richer after death. Um, and then the idea of the dust um, is, is played with again, a dust whom England bore. And that uh, verb there, bore, um, it means to England gave birth to. So we're beginning to get the idea here that England is being personified. If you look at the next line, England, well, uh, shaped him. It made him aware. So it brought him consciousness. It, it helped him grow. Um, it gave him her flowers, her ways to roam. So we've got the personification of England as, as a mother figure, as a maternal figure, almost as if he sees his relationship with England as being as close to his relationship with, with, with his mother. Um, and of course, the flowers there, these are this idea of England's England's natural beauty. Um, um, and then the next part, her ways to roam, uh, the freedoms that, that England gives him. And the idea is played with, again, a body of England's breathing English air, washed by the rivers, blessed by sons of home. So we've got some imagery here of baptism, of course, what happens um, to, a, to a child when they enter the church. Um, so England washed him, it blessed him. Um, and we've got this notion of, of England bringing about new life, 
but also the sense that that England is in some way blessed by God in its perfection. So we're starting to see some heavenly imagery associated with England. In the second stanza, things take a bit of a shift. Things become a bit more complicated. And think this heart or evil shed away. So there's this idea of his heart still existing after death. So probably um, a reference to his spirit, um, what's supposedly left of a person after they die. All evil shed away. I think that's a reference to the horrors of war. All of the things that, that you have to do as a soldier, all the um, courageous acts and sacrifices you've made and um, the murders you've committed uh, have gone. And now you are a pulse in the eternal mind. In other words, you become part of the universe. Your spirit exists in the wider universe forever. And it achieves this sense of immortality. And so when you are immortal and in heaven, you will give back the thoughts by England given. So you will um, return all that goodness and all that purity and all that, that knowledge that England gave you being a, a child of England. Her sights and sounds, dreams happy as her day. So all of those cherished childhood memories, you will give back in the in the afterlife. Um, and notice again, these these images of happiness, laughter, friendship, gentleness, hearts at peace under an English heaven. And so ultimately he dies knowing that his sacrifice is worthwhile. Um, and he's protecting a nation whose values are as pure as heaven. So we get the sense here all the time that that England and heaven are not two separate places. They're actually the same thing. So there you go. All of you sitting there at home, actually, you're living in heaven, according to Rupert Brooke. Look out of your windows and look at your garden, you know. You are living in England. Look at the sky. It's beautiful <laughs> if you believe in, in, in Brooke's poem. So an interesting poem. And I think its structure is really important. So let's have a look at it for the moment. It's divided into two stanzas. Um, and this was quite a traditional thing to do with a sonnet. The first stanza is eight lines long and it's known as the octave. And if you look at the imagery and the descriptions in this first stave, I'm sorry, not save, octave, you will notice that most of them are about the earth, about nature, about the tangible stuff, the things that you can touch um, in England. Whereas when you move to the second part of the poem, the last six lines, which are known as the sestet, um, suddenly we seem to move from earth to, to heaven. We move from the realm of mankind to the unearthly realm of the spirit, spirits, heaven itself. So there is quite a jump in the poem. And this, as you'll probably know, is called the volta of a poem. The volta is, is a shift or a turning point. And so we move from the tangible world, the earthly world, to the intangible world, the heavenly world in this poem. Um, and we get this sense of immortality that your life on earth um, may be short and you may have to give the ultimate sacrifice. But in heaven, you will give back um, all of all of the great things you learned in your childhood to, um, to the universe. So just to summarize, the main ideas in this poem, it's about the honor and glory of, of dying for your um, country. It's the direct opposite and antithesis to Wilfred Owen's um, uh, gory and horrific uh, dulce et decorum est. The poem also can be considered a love poem um, it, it's a poem about the natural beauty of England. Yet underneath that, um, which which is uncomfortable to me, is about England's superiority, um, his patriotism perhaps for modern readers goes a bit too far. 
Then we've got the idea of England personified as a maternal figure. And I think that sort of helps to reinforce these ideas about love, that the, the close bond, the inseparable bond he has with England is no different from the, um, the attachment that a child might have with their mother. Um, and perhaps he wrote this poem, I think, if we look at number four, to, to help him come to terms with the idea of death. Because in the poem, death seems to free him and seems to bring him closer to God. And underneath the poem is the message. It's propaganda to the soldiers going out there to fight on the front line that if you die, well, hey, you're going to get closer to God. You're going to live in heaven. And it won't be that much different from England because you were in, were in heaven anyway. So last of all, that idea of heaven reflecting English values and English values reflecting heaven. So there you go. I hope you've enjoyed this. Thank you very much.